Welcome, everybody. We got a crowd today. Nice. I've only been here five times, so this is a lot. Very exciting stuff. I'm very excited to be here. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be able to speak today. Thank you, Howard, for that awesome introduction. So today I want to share with you all a couple of stories. One is my testimony, a portion of my testimony, and how I got to where I am today. And the other is a Bible story that really parallels that testimony story. And so I want to have a really quick prayer before I open God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I ask that you just speak through me today, and if there is just one person out there that needs to hear this message, touch their hearts and let them hear it. I am just a vessel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the first story comes from Ezekiel 37, if you want to follow along. But we're going to go right into the story as if we are in this story. But Ezekiel 37 is where we're going. Now imagine with me that you're standing in the middle of a huge valley. And as you look around, all you see are bones. Thousands and thousands of bones stretched across the valley from one side to the other. As if this wasn't bad enough, you realize as you scan the bones around your feet that these are the bones of people. Lots and lots of people. You can't help but ask yourself, what happened here? And as your mind starts to wander through all the possibilities, you feel the goosebumps pop up on your arms and this eerie feeling start to take hold as your chest tightens and a lump forms in your throat. You want to, as we say in the South, hightail it out of there. But you're frozen. All you can do is take in the magnitude of devastation around you. Then a question is asked of you. Can these bones live? You look around. They are pretty dry. Not an inch of flesh is on them. It's hard to imagine them ever being living people. In your mind, these bones may be beyond any hope of restoration, but only God knows. Then you're told, prophesy to these bones and tell them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, if you're anything like me, your reaction may be something like, you want me to do what? These are bones. They can't hear anything. Then you hear God's voice say to the bones. We're in Ezekiel 37, verse 5 through 6. This is what God says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And as we stand in this valley, this valley of bones, we follow what God has told us to do, even though it doesn't really make any sense. And we share with these bones the word of God. And as we begin to speak, a strange noise starts to fill the valley. And then the ground begins to shake. The bones at our feet start darting this way and sliding that way as they begin connecting with each other. We speak louder, proclaiming the word of God, trying to pitch our voice over the noise that is now thundering through the valley. Our eyes are as big as saucers as we watch the bones connect, forming legs and arms and bodies. And then the skeletons all around us begin to form muscle and tissue over each bone. Then one body after another is covered in skin. Now, our mouths are probably gaping just a little 
as we realize that we are no longer in a valley of dry bones, but a valley of bodies. We should be afraid, more like terrified, but adrenaline is surging through us as we realize the power of God. Then another command comes to speak a prophetic message, and we say, as the Lord tells us, we're now in verse 9. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. And as the words leave our lips, a gushing wind sweeps through the valley, almost taking us off our feet. And we hear in unison as the whole valley of bodies takes in the breath. <sighs> we stare in awe as each person that was once a heap of bones begins to stand until we're surrounded by the largest group of people we've ever seen and they're all staring back at us. I kind of understand that moment right now. And God tells us who these people are and we look into the faces of his people whose bones were dry, whose hope was completely lost. And as they stand anxiously awaiting, we tell the words God has given us. We tell them about Jesus and how he is Lord and how he brought them out of their graves. We tell them how he will put his spirit in them and they will live. And they will know that it was all because of Jesus. This incredible vision was experienced by Ezekiel, this amazing young man called by God to prophesy to Israel. And he has this vision of this valley of bones. And God asks Ezekiel in verse 3, can these bones live? And we see as we follow this vision that through the power of God, the bones come back to life as Ezekiel follows his instructions. Now, I can only imagine the intense feelings Ezekiel must have had during that vision as he's standing in that valley having that experience. But as crazy as it sounds, there's such a valuable question that we can't miss. Can these bones live? When I was reading about Ezekiel's vision and hearing in my own mind this question, I could not help but think about my own life. It took me back to a time when I was just like these bones. To most, I was too far gone. I was desperate and living out each day in this dark valley that I couldn't escape from. The first time I realized I was in this valley was just over 20 years ago, I had just graduated from academy. I was standing in my bathroom, rejected and broken, because my boyfriend, who I thought was the one, had just taken off with another girl, taking my heart and my innocence with him. Now, as a born and raised Adventist Christian hailing from a conservative family, I knew the rules. I knew what sins were labeled as worse than others. Yet here I stood in the shadow of one of those very sins. This was the type of sin you were judged for, shamed for, I knew I couldn't go back to church, let alone tell my parents. At church, I saw what happened to people who made mistakes. I saw the looks they would get. I heard the whispers behind their back, public shaming, disfellowship. 
I believed that because of what I had done, I could not be forgiven. So before they could turn their back on me, I left the church and I turned my back on God. And for the next 10 years, I lived out this outcast mentality. And my life went spiraling out of control. I was fighting against this hopelessness and looking for anything to fill that hole that was in my heart. I found a group of friends that were broken just like me. Those kind of people are pretty easy to find, actually. And we spent our days and nights partying, drinking, using drugs, you name it. Each day that went by, a piece of me died. Each day that went by, I cared less and less. I remember early on, after a weekend of partying, I woke up feeling really sad and broken. I really wanted hope. And so I convinced myself that I would get up and go to church because that's where you find hope, right? I needed a sign that God still cared. I needed to know that I wasn't too far gone. So I looked terrible. I threw on jeans, a t-shirt, a baseball hat, and left before I could talk myself out of it. It took me 10 minutes to talk myself into going into the building. But I did. And I made it three feet into the foyer of the church before a man stopped me and he said, oh no, you cannot come in here looking like that. I still remember his finger pointing to the door for me to leave. I took this rejection as a sign that God wasn't interested in forgiving me. I walked out of that church and stumbled farther and farther into that valley. And I had moments where I tried to sober up. I would see friends OD, I would see friends die, but nothing ever seemed to stick. I was stuck in this cycle of addiction. At one point, I had made some big changes in my life to try and get back on track. I quit my job, got a new one, I dumped the friends. I wanted to clean slate it and just start over. I even had a date with a new guy. I remember while I was on this date, I went into the hallway of the restaurant to call my friend to tell her how it was going, and I was really excited. I said, this is going great, he's so nice. And I'm just so excited because I think that I can really stick with my sobriety this time. I went back to the date, finished my drink, and then everything went dark. This nice guy drugged me and assaulted me in the worst possible way. This was one of the darkest times of my life, and it nearly broke me. I had never felt so hopeless. I thought that this was God punishing me for my sins. But little did I know, God had not deserted me. And even though I didn't realize it at the time, he was right there holding me, crying with me, loving me. And I made it through. After a long time, I began seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. And it was a total act of God how I met my husband, Joe. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but he has been this 
light in my life. But we went through a lot. I struggled with my emptiness, my brokenness. I didn't think I deserved to be loved. And even though I found love, that's not good enough to forgive me for my mistakes. It wasn't good enough to save me. I relapsed multiple times, but he never gave up on me. Finally, May 27th, 2007, I said, no more. I'm done with this. I entered therapy, and with Joe by my side, I sobered up and have never looked back. In fact, five days from today is 14 years sober. Yes. I thank God for putting people in my life that showed me unconditional love and showed me what it looked like. I didn't get that as a kid. Family and church, that wasn't my experience. And if it wasn't for my husband and my kids, I wouldn't understand forgiving the love. You know, I'd been out of the church for 10 years when our daughter Paige was born. And in the first seconds I saw her when she was born, I said, is this what Jesus feels like when he looks at us? I wasn't even in church. I had no relationship with God. Why am I saying this? But I wondered where a love like this came from. Because a love like this was different. A love like this wouldn't shame. A love like this wouldn't reject you. A love like this was unconditional. See, my dead bones were starting to rattle, and one at a time, they began to reconnect. Our little family began going to church. We wanted to find a place to call home. I'm like, where is this God? I need to find him. So now my dead bones begin to form muscle and skin. This valley's changing. Things are happening. But then, one weekend at church, someone found out about my past and made it very clear that we were not welcome there anymore. So here I lay in the valley, no longer bones, yet still dead. Then our son Bryce is born, and again I say, how can God not love us this way? It was in 2012, the year my son was born, when our family stepped into a different church that wasn't like any other church we've ever experienced up to that point. And it was on that day that I pushed my way to the front after the service to talk to the elder, and I walked up to him and I said, hi, my name is Carrie, I have a sketchy past, can I come here? The elder looked right at me, and without missing a beat, he says, so do I. There is no better place for you to be. <laughs> That's it, yes. It was in this church where I was told that I was valuable, that I was forgivable, that I was intensely loved by Jesus, and I was invited to a Bible study. I remember the day that I gave my life back to God. I knelt down and I prayed for forgiveness. The one thing I thought I couldn't have. And in that moment, it was as if a mighty wind blew over me and I felt alive, like every fiber of my being was functioning for the first time. I stood, and I took my first breath, born again. And I knew I was here because of Jesus and what he had done for me. And because of that, I was never going to go back. I knew that all I wanted to do in this life was to tell people about this Jesus that I didn't hear about as a kid. 
I mean, I'm in my 30s when I'm first hearing about this. This isn't okay. Fast forward a few years, and I'm headed to the seminary, which also is another story all in itself, following God's path for me to go into ministry. I graduated. I was hired in Oregon as a pastor. And in that chapter of my life, I had the privilege of walking with others through their valley and watching God bring them back to life, too. I don't ever want anyone ever thinking they are unlovable or unforgivable. It doesn't matter what you've done. God is desperate to forgive you. Ministry has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. My family, Joe, Paige, Bryce, and I are now on to the next chapter here in North Carolina. I'm glad I have a job. Rejection is tough. I got a little bit of that. That's okay. That's okay. God prepared me. But this church, this church takes us back. This church takes our family back to that place nine years ago that opened up their arms to us and said, you are welcome here. You are family. It is said that you can't choose your family. I disagree. Family are those in our lives who show us unconditional love. I had to choose my family. My family are my aunts and uncles who stepped in to fill the gap and loved me as their own. Family is my husband and kids who see me for me. Family is walking into this church and seeing welcome home on the big screen when you come into the sanctuary. <laughs> Family truly is each and every one of you. A couple of weeks ago on our second Sabbath here, Madison said to me, you are family. And she had no idea what our family has been through or my struggle with that word. But God used her to remind us where we belong. So my family, in closing, I want to remind you that there are people all around us that are in this valley. And maybe they struggle with addiction, hurt. Maybe they feel shame. Maybe they've experienced rejection. I ask you, can these bones live? And maybe some of you are dry bones, joined to the church but not united with Christ. Or maybe you're watching online, you haven't come back to in-person church, and you feel disconnected from the body and you feel like you're falling deeper and deeper into this valley, I ask you, can these bones live? I stand in front of you today that yes, these bones can live. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. This is that heart of flesh. And this is the amazing gift God offers to each one of us. And as Ezekiel says, when the Spirit is put in us, we will live. We will what? We will live. All those years ago, someone opened up God's word to me and welcomed me with open arms, and they called out to my dry bones, come alive. And God's breath filled me, and I became a new creation. And the best part is, all of us can come alive. No matter how hopeless our situation, no matter how sketchy our past, 
Jesus wants us to come home. This church wants you to come home. Because I'm telling you, there is no better place for you to be. I'm calling to those that are in the valley right now. God is ready to transform you and give you that new heart. Let's stand as we pray for this transformation. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you see the hearts of each person in this room, each person listening. They need you. We need you. We say enough to rejection. You accept us as we are, our past and all, our mistakes and all, and you love us unconditionally. God, I ask that you allow the Holy Spirit to touch the hearts of the people here, the people listening, and let them know that you are waiting with open arms to love them, to forgive them, to help them move out of that valley. And may each of us, by faith, stand at that valley and call to those, come alive, and to be that shining light that someone so desperately needs. I ask these things in God's holy name. Amen.